Welcome back to Storytellers. I'm your host, John Harkness. I'm the founder and publisher of Falstaff Books, and occasionally I'll write a few things as well. Uh, joining us today are not only Gail Z. Martin, but also my co-host from one of our other shows here on YouTube, Book Babble, Melissa MacArthur, who is the head kitten wrangler at Falstaff Books, the person who's in charge of keeping my schedule, and um, one of the two people who makes sure that I get fed at conventions <laughs> because I cannot be allowed out in public without a minder. <laughs> or two. <clears throat> but our guest for this, this episode is Gail Z. Martin. Gail is the author of the Chronicles of the Necromancer series, the Deadly Curiosity series, and about a dozen other series here and there for Solar, Solaris, Orbit, Falstaff, Soul, Dark Wind. She's been in about 500 anthologies over the past few years. And um, so we're going to talk about her publishing journey, where she is now, where she wants to go, where she's been, and where the dogs are. So, <laughs> Gail, thanks for hanging out with us for a little bit. Well, thanks for having me. This is fun, um, especially since we've all been, you know, at home instead of at conventions. It's wonderful to see everybody again. Yeah, usually we, the three of us, don't go three weeks without sitting somewhere sharing a meal at some really mediocre hotel bar. Well, and that's assuming that we didn't all road trip to that mediocre hotel together in the first place, which leads to even more mediocre and questionable road food. I still think the winner, though, was when we crashed the employee-only lunch <laughs> at that steakhouse on the way. I don't remember. It was one of the Virginia conventions. Melissa, yeah, were you with us on that? I don't remember this one. Darren, we always put Darren in charge of finding the food, and he wanted to eat it at this place, and we get there, and they have this sign outside, and it was a friends and family soft opening for a Longhorn Steakhouse, I think. Yeah. And, um, but we got there, and the manager said, well, come on in. And if you split a steak with someone, you could get the steak free. Otherwise, everything else on the menu was free including dessert because yeah. they were you know checking to see if their systems were working and breaking in people staff could them. make food and yeah they wanted to see if they could make and deliver food and so we got free food at a steakhouse it was great <laughs> this is why we let darren find the food that mm -hmm. that trip i still can't remember where we were going but that trip i ate for free coming and going because coming home was where Darren tried to murder me at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> he decided that we should have Cracker Barrel and I said, okay, fine. Um, they've changed their hiring practices. So I will eat at Cracker Barrel again. And boy, they have ab judging by the wait staff we experienced, they have absolutely made their hiring practices far more progressive than they used to be. Uh, but <clears throat> we got our food and I looked at Darren and I ordered and I was like, I don't know, should I get the chicken and dumplings or should I get the chicken tenders? Chicken and dumplings? Chicken. It's like chicken tenders is usually my safe road meal. And we were a good five hours from home. And I was like, we don't need to be three hours from dying. I need safe. So I picked the chicken tenders. I got my food and I looked at Darren and pointed to the mutant chicken tender on my plate and said, that is not going to be cooked. He said, what do you mean? I said, and it had like folded over itself mm -hmm. when they put it in the deep fryer. And I was like, look at how that, look at how that thing is sitting. That came out of a deep fryer with a timer. And the center of that piece of chicken is not going to be cooked. He said, I bet you're right. 
you shouldn't eat it. I said, thank you, Dr. Kennedy. <laughs> so I cut it open and sure enough, it was raw as could be. So I, I had already segregated it on my plate. <clears throat> so I w brought the waitress over and said, hey, I know this isn't your fault. I'm not upset, but this isn't cooked. So I'm going to need a clean plate, a new set of silverware, and maybe a replacement chicken tender. I didn't really need the replacement chicken tender because as is fairly obvious, the camera does not add 10 pounds. I'm this big. So I could stand to only eat three out of four pieces of any meal. But she got all in a tizzy, oh my God, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I started this with I'm not upset because I know I look like a mass murderer. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so she brought me all of that stuff and then said, I'm going to replace your entire entree. I said, okay, I'm not giving you the rest of this back. <laughs> I'm going to eat the stuff that's actually cooked. She said, I don't care. I said, okay, well then bring me some chicken and dumplings because I wasn't sure which one I wanted anyway. So I got the chicken tenders and the chicken and dumplings. And on a visit from the manager and an apology and my meal was comped. And I was like, y'all, you got a mutant chicken tender in the bag. I know what happened. It, okay, fine. <clears throat> So Darren, hey. tried, Darren tried to murder me and I got free food. Well, it's better than the time he and I ended up both getting food poisoning from the convention center in West Virginia. There is We're no even more free. terrifying <laughs> phone call than two days after you get back from a convention and the guy you roomed with for the entire trip calls you up the guy who happens to be a physician calls you up and said, have you been sick like ever since we got home? No. Did you eat the barbecue at the convention center? Hell no. I looked at the barbecue at the convention center. He said, well, Gail and I did and Gail and I are sick. I said, well, one, Y'all are grown ass humans and you should, you knew what that looked like when you were there. Two, is Jim sick? Cause Jim and I had the same opinion of the, of the barbecue and we both ate pizza both days. He said, nope, Jim's not sick either. I said, okay. I, my medical training consists of having seen the movie Outbreak twice, but I'm betting that the barbecue was fucked up. It was. Y'all were bad sick. We were bad sick, yeah. Don't really need to be any sicker than that. I have a very short list of places I'll eat barbecue from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to our friends Quincy and Vicky, one of those places is right around the corner from Melissa's house. It's good to you. And it's will... right next to a laundromat. Yeah, which is good for a barbecue joint. <laughs> it's true. So, Gail, you started off life as a purely traditionally published New York level, although your publishers were based in the UK, we'll still say you were a New York published author. How did that, how did you get there? How did that work out? Tell us a little about how you got started, and then tell us about crashing Dave Drake's book signing and making him answer questions for two hours. <laughs> well, that, ha that happened early on. That happened when we were in uh, Richmond, Virginia. But backing it up a little bit, I knew I wanted to write books since I was about 14. That was when I kind of actually thought about where books came from and that people who were currently alive were writing books. And my 14-year-old brain said, well, someday those people will die. And if new people aren't writing books, then there won't be any new books. Wait a second. This means just like regular people can write books. Well, then I'm going to write books. 
that and that was kind of the thought process. So that I didn't a lot wonder, more logical than how I got into this. <laughs> well, I knew I wanted to tell stories. I, I had written a lot of fan fiction in, in high school and college. And that taught me that I could entertain people with my stories. And I learned a lot about the structure of writing and what made a good story. And I got a lot of unbridled feedback. And so that was a terrific training ground. Of course, this was way before normal people had access to the internet. So sharing that fan fiction meant you went to a convention, camped in somebody's room, everybody sat down in a line on the floor, and you passed either Xeroxed or typed or handwritten copies of the stories down the line, read one, pass it on, read one, pass it on, and you just be there all night. Um, that was kind of how it worked before the net. Thank God for the internet. Yeah. Or you, you <laughs> bought these things. It was so hard to get porn back then, too. <laughs> you bought these fanzines that people uh, ran out of the basement or the garage, and they were photocopied again. And, man, if you could get your hands on one of those – it had stories in it and it had artwork in it. That's kind of what we were stuck with. Um, but that, that really reinforced that I wanted to write. So when I did my undergraduate degree, I did it in medieval history because I wanted to write epic fantasy. And then I did an MBA in marketing because I needed a side gig to afford typing paper. Um, <laughs> pretty much what it was. Uh, that was my emotional attachment to marketing. Pays the bills until I can actually write the books. I Would learned you? everything I learned about being a writer on a manual typewriter. I learned from the book Misery. I um, ignore that. Um, I wasn't going to answer it. Pardon, yeah. I um, had a manual typewriter at home. Not that electric typewriters weren't out in the world. We just didn't have one for a very long time. So. Fast forward, I spent about 17 years, pardon me. Okay, we can edit that part, right? We could. We're not going to. This We're not real going. live, people. <laughs> live and in person. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, <clears throat> took about 17 years, did the whole corporate marketing thing, finally ended up getting laid off and said, you know what, if I'm going to do this book stuff, I'm, um, now is the time. So I sent out letters looking to get uh, an agent because it was about 2005 and that's how things worked at the time. And I got a lot of rejection letters and then I finally had a few near misses, switched up my cover letter more than the book and landed the agent that I've had now for the last 14 years. Um, <clears throat> which has been a terrific partnership. He had a line on a new publisher that was coming out in England that um, they were at that time owned by the people who owned um, Warhammer, and, but this was gonna be a brand new imprint and they needed a launch title and they wanted something that was classic epic fantasy. And he said, I happen to have classic epic fantasy. So The Summoner, which was the first book in the Chronicles of the Necromancer, ended up being the launch title for Solaris Books, which was at that time an imprint of Warhammer. So that went really, really well and did a number of books with Solaris. And then they, Warhammer decided that maybe writing original fiction wasn't as lucrative as creating gaming materials and gaming tie-in books. And so they sold off Solaris. And there was a period there where it was just taking a long time for the sale to go through. My agent and I didn't want to skip a year releasing books. So Orbit said, hey, you know, we're interested. Um, let's just move everything over there. So Orbit at that time was a big London publisher that was just starting to get its feet under itself in New York. Um, but it, it had the capital to make that happen. So. I ended up going to Orbit, did about six or eight books with them, and then various and sundry things happened with the publishing world, with Orbit, with me, and um, 
at the end of the Ascendant Kingdom saga, we parted ways. So I kind of looked at things and said, okay, what now? Went back to Solaris with a couple of, of series in that, in that time period with the Deadly Curiosity series and um, the Iron and Blood uh, steampunk series. And then just kind of looked at things and said, you know, we're doing an awful lot of work here. The, the world has changed. Publishing has changed. We're not getting anything really from some of these publishers other than bookstore placement that we aren't kind of doing for ourselves anyhow. And we had started at this point bringing out short stories independently. Well, you know, you do a lot of those after a while, you figure we can do something longer like a book. We're already doing this process. And so, um, and, and, you know, there were some, there were a couple issues with an editor there who strongly wanted me to do some things that I was very uncomfortable doing with the books and it was just time to part ways. Now, Bob, and, yeah, go ahead. I don't, I'm not going to deep dive into any of the specifics, right? but that highlights a fear that I hear from a lot of unpublished writers who are talking about, well, I'm just going to go indie because I don't want an editor to change my book. So let's talk a little bit about that process because my experience has been, and my experience is with much smaller houses, but editors don't change your book you still have the right to walk away. So this is true. They're not supposed to change your book. Right. Um, my, the problem that I had had run into with Orbit was that they had so much turnover in their editorial department. I was with them for six years and six books. I had three different editors in that six year period. And for two and a half years, I didn't have an editor at all because they were in the process of hiring an editor, yeah. which there was no consistency. And while my first editor had a lot of industry experience, um, the subsequent ones I had either didn't have experience in the genre or were brand spanking new out of school and had plenty of enthusiasm, but no industry chops. They didn't, they couldn't say, well, you know, uh, if you if you just shift this a little bit, that's what we did for big name author, and and man, that really just opened things up. Um, they they could pretty well proofread, and yeah. I knew we were in trouble when the last author that I had there, who was about two years older than my oldest daughter, um, I'm not kidding, tried to talk me out of killing a character in book four of the series whose death had been foreshadowed for the previous two books because she really liked the character. And I said, no, I can't not kill him. It, it matters to the course of the book. But, but, but I can't not kill him. He's dead, okay? He's going to die. So that told me maybe this was not the best editorial relationship, although we got along fine. Ideally, what you get from an author, from an editor, is somebody who makes your writing sound the very best it can be. And they, yeah. they point out where you've got a slow spot or where something isn't clear or where you really haven't ex, you know, brought the character to life. And, and they help you make the book much better, but it's still your book. What I ran into with Solaris, um, and I will say that the editor at the time was having you know, a, a lot of um, personal issues as well that I think did affect the situation. Um, you know, I, I ran into a situation where the editor forced me to whitewash a whole set of characters because he was uncomfortable with them being people of color. And that was not negotiable. And that it started to become more and more intrusive to the point where um, he actually rewrote a third of the book. And I sent it back. I mean, not, these are notes. This is, I'm rewriting your book. This That's was about so my, bad. yeah, this was about my 15th book. So I think we had already proven that I could write for publication. Yeah. Um, and I went back to my agent and said, is this my imagination? I don't think I'm really being um, 
a diva about this. And he said, no, this is going further than it should. And at yeah. that point, um, our only real choice was to walk away. Uh, I was able to bring the book out in, uh, I, I got the rights back to that book and brought it out, uh, we brought it out ourselves as we wanted it to be. And I hired a uh, terrific editor who has worked with a lot of well-established and, and uh, very successful authors. Got a and, from her today, by the way. And uh, she did not have any of the same issues that the previous editor did. So I'm not exactly sure what happened there, but um, it ended up being for the best because what we found was we really did have the skills to bring books out. We knew the people to do the editing and, and we found some great cover artists. And so that's been, we've been bringing out a lot of the books um, independently. And then, you know, we have the three series that we're doing right now with Falstaff, right. which we love working with. Can we love yeah. this? Um, you know, that, um, the big, the big mental shift that I, when I talk to New York level authors who are moving to a small press or moving to going indie, the big mental shift that they have to make that I think you were already predisposed to making, what, pardon me, was that New York sells books to bookstores and librarians. Indies and small presses sell books to humans who read books. We are working towards reaching readers, not reaching gatekeepers or distribu distributors. We love booksellers, we love librarians, they're awesome, but the way they purchase books for their institutions is very structured and often doesn't work with indies. Either well, not only that, or but, individuals. Yeah, not only that, but at the time, um, and, and I think we're seeing a little bit of a resurgence now, but all the bookstores were closing. Yeah. So if there aren't bookstores, or they are not as key to getting books into people's hands as they used to be, then the fact that they can, they might have your book in stock if you go through XYZ Publisher is a lot less of a big deal. And especially as bookstores that did survive really cut back on how much they carried a backlist, it's also dubious on if they're only going to stock book three, seven, and nine of your series, Who how much they help. Certainly in epic fantasy where it's not episodic storytelling, it's very much serialized storytelling. But I think that you were already of a mindset to reach individuals because you've always done the convention circuit. Like you said, that was part of your upbringing as a writer and as a storyteller, sitting on the floor of people's hotel rooms, sharing fan fiction. I just, sitting on the floor of hotel rooms makes me shudder even before pandemics that would make me shudder. Gail, yeah, when you're talking about this stuff, um, you say we. Um, in case some of the viewers don't know, uh, could you tell us who we sure. are? <laughs> um, so my, my co-author on at least four series so far is my husband, Larry Ann Martin, and he's the co-author on the uh, Iron and Blood Jake Desmond Adventures and on the um, Joe Mack and Spell, Salt, and Steel, and Wasteland Marshall series with Falstaff. And behind the scenes, Larry really makes everything happen because he is the first uh, and, and very thorough editor before it ever leaves the house. Um, he does all the formatting for the books that we bring out indie. He does, um, he handles all the spreadsheets for the royalties and all of that. So he does, all, a lot of the stuff behind the scenes, as well as 
being very involved with the brainstorming and the plotting. And, and we bounce this stuff off each other all the time, either as we're taking the dogs around the walk or just sitting at dinner is, okay, I'm stuck on this scene. Where do we go from here? Or with a new series, we'll sit down and create the characters together and walk through the world building together. So it's a very collaborative uh, effort. And Larry's been in, uh, in with me full time since 2011 when he left corporate. So uh, that, that's a huge reason that we're able to bring out the, uh, the books as frequently as we do and write as many books because they're really two people behind it. Now, awesome. that's the one version of we, but you're all, the two of you are also two people, yes. not just Gail and Larry. La two years ago, is that about where we are? About 2018? Yeah. So in 2018, you embarked on a whole new adventure where want to talk about rebranding re and repackaging. Tell us about Morgan Bryce. Well, I, uh, it all started with Supernatural. So I started, John knows, I can see the look on his face. <laughs> uh, Viewer, never, those of you viewing at home, I might have not only heard this story, I might have been present for some of this starting so so um i started watching the show about halfway through season 11 totally fell in love with it and binge watched all 11 seasons in time for the premiere of season 12 so i could live tweet the show and um after that just as anybody who knows me knows i've been a diehard fan but in that hiatus between the end of season 11 and beginning of season 12 uh, it was just intolerable that there weren't any new episodes. So I did something I hadn't done for a very long time, which was go out and read fan fiction. And I was totally hooked. There's some excellent, excellent writing out there. So I started with all the case fic, which is just like, you know, extra episodes. And then I uh, decided to see what this slash stuff was like and absolutely fell in love and read several hundred of those. And then I popped up for air and said, I wonder what the non-fandom related published male male romance looks like and whether they have any paranormal stuff. Well, I found that and I read several hundred of those and said, man, this is just too much fun. I am not missing out on this. I got to do some of this for myself. So we, uh, the whole family actually brainstormed on the Morgan Bryce pseudonym. And the only reason I use a pseudonym for the urban fantasy male male paranormal romance is because the, the Gale and the Gale and Larry books don't have any explicit sex and the Morgan stuff does. And I didn't want to give anybody a heart attack picking up a book and getting much more than they expected. So it really is a totally open secret. It's, it's truly a branding thing. But uh, I had no idea how it was gonna go. And we brought out Witchbane, which is, you know, solidly an urban fantasy. It's about 50% urban fantasy. It's about 50% romance. And there's always been some romance in the Gale stuff. All the sexy bits take place off camera, so to speak. But it's probably only about 10% or less than the plot. Uh, you know, the, the plot is solidly action. And, and, oh, yeah, when you're not fighting a battle, there's some romance going on. Um, the male, the uh, Morgan Bryce stuff, is about 50 50 plot romance solidly on the the romance solidly on uh the sexy times and first book which fame did pretty well came out with badlands which was the first in another new series and that one got the orange banner that one hit number one in lgbt fantasy hung there for a decent amount of time and that was really the proof of concept hey look this is going to really work and uh, it was about that time, well, I got a call from um, Recorded Books saying, hey, we, we really like your Badlands uh, book. See some really nice numbers there. We'd like to, do you have anybody lined up to do your um, audiobooks? And I said, let me put you in touch with my agent because my agent was already working with them under the Gale name on my Gale stuff. It's just, I hadn't told my agent yet about the Morgan stuff. 
At which point I said, hey, uh, I did this thing. I uh, started writing urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance as Morgan Bryce and now recorded books once to talk about audio contracts. Can I just hand that over to you because you handle all that stuff for me and never missed a beat. <laughs> so <laughs> this is why we've had such a great relationship for 14 years. Um, so that's really how it, it all came together. And I have met a whole new wonderful group of writers and readers through all of this. And it's just been a lot of fun. Well, one, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only person that you do that. Hey, so I did a thing thing to because we were on that call earlier today and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but I find the concept of open pseudonyms to be really interesting because you're about the third writer that I know, fourth writer that I know that has a very open pseudonym. Um, Kim Harrison's very open about the fact that that's not a real name. <laughs> um, David, David Coe and D.B. Jackson, he even has his, his name tag at most conventions is David B. Coe slash D.B. Jackson. Um, and I, when we got started working on Times Assassin, I had to message him and say, hey, who's, which one of you is writing this? Because mm -hmm. I couldn't remember. But pseudonyms used to be a big secret, especially when you're in a, a Sexy Times style genre. Well, and for some authors, it still needs to be because they have uh, personal situations where it would be difficult or possibly dangerous for them. So, you know, if you've got an author who is working full time in a conventional job, they have legitimate worries about what their employer might think, particularly if they're writing in something like romance where there's explicit sex or where there might be controversy. I know people who have not told their family or are not on good terms with their family. And if you're writing uh, LGBTQ uh, romance, that can be a problem. Uh, or people who have safety concerns because of stalkers or um, exes or, you know, just different situations that are personal. I'm very lucky in that we do this full time. So there is no employer to please other than my publishers who are the books selling good. We're happy. Um, you know, it's pretty basic. And I've been very lucky that even though, you know, I did, I'm, I'm not bringing out new books with Solaris and Orbit. We parted on very good terms. As I've said to them, uh, look, you guys have my backlist. So it's sort of like you're the ex who has joint custody. So we really, <laughs> it's like you both, st you still hold the note on the vacation home together. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, that's been very congenial and they really didn't care. And you know, you're, you've been married to the same person for a long time. So creepy ex is not so much an issue. Uh, Larry's a big dude. So stalkers, not so much an issue. Um, you're generally around either him or me at a convention, so stalker's not so much an issue. Yeah, so I didn't have some of the concerns that I, I totally understand the folks who do have a pseudonym that has to remain a secret uh, have, and, and I get that. I was very lucky. And I think I'm, I think the other thing that plays into that is bringing the Morgan Bryce stuff out at a time when I've got enough of a backlist as Gail or Gail and Larry that I think I've kind of 
um, proven my chops. And I'm at a point in life where I have many fewer flips to give. <laughs> oh, you can say fuck. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> what if you were fucks to give? <laughs> and I, I think that that certainly also changes how you decide to do things because you can. You know, not only that, the the uh, the kids were all grown up. They were out doing their own lives. So I didn't have to worry about this reflecting on anybody. Uh, yeah, your kids actually finally are the ones who said you know, mom, you can use our names on social media. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, they draw the line at, at beta reading the, the sexy stuff. You know, nobody really wants to know that their parents actually know anything about this, even though their existence is proof. Yeah. I don't publish explicit sexual content, not because I'm a, I have an objection to it, but because I'm really good friends with a lot of my authors, and I don't want to think about y'all that way. <laughs> <laughs> that is not what I want popping into my head when we're at a convention together. Like, no, no, we'll just leave that for other folks. <laughs> so we were very lucky to have that freedom. Uh, and, and Larry was out of corporate, so there was no issue there. And, mm -hmm. and that, that is a freedom that a lot of other authors don't have. And I understand that. Yeah. I mean, I know at least one or two of our author friends who work under a pseudonym because of jobs they have or have had. Mm -hmm. Now for me, where it gets confusing is when I have only ever known them from the writing world. And then I realized that's not their real name. Well, that happens to me all the time. I always joke that for someone who's not in the mafia, I have such a large percentage of my friend group that, that I only know under aliases. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and there was one time I read a book by an author that I knew, and I had been friends with him and his wife, who is also another author, for a long time. And the, um, the husband's book had a dedication to my lovely wife and a name. And the first thing that went through my mind is, holy hell, I wonder what author pseudonym is going to think of that. And then I realized, duh, that's not actually her real name. But it took a few mental steps to realize, oh. I literally did the same thing with a married couple friends of ours that are authors the guy was talking about probably the same married couple yeah probably he was talking about his wife and talk and referring to her by her real name i had no idea that she wrote under a pseudonym because it wasn't like lolita sexy times it was a <laughs> normal <laughs> name <laughs> yeah. and then get faith hunter going sometime about the various names that she has had through her career, all of which are some variation on her real name. AJ's the same way. He's, he's running about three yeah. different pseudonyms, depending on whether he's doing academic. academic or thrillers or middle grades. Yeah. And that was something that I think got really pushed by traditional publishers back in the day. Yeah. Because traditional publishers really think readers are stupid. And they have this thing that a reader isn't going to look at a cover. At, let's be serious. Epic fantasy and urban fantasy covers, really unlikely to mix those up. They don't seem to think that readers are smart enough to figure out, hey, this isn't the same series. It might be different. I might like one and not the other. What I've yeah. found to my surprise, actually, at the degree of it is when we, when we brought out the Morgan Bryce stuff, I made no secret about, hey, guys, I'm doing this other thing over here, but I'll, you know, it'll be relatively separate, but not really. And if you're interested, come on over. I did not expect the significant percentage of my Gail and Gail and Larry readers who came right over. Oh, that's and great. And then, uh, well, it definitely got Morgan Bryce off to a great start. Well, then 
I told my Morgan readers, hey, you've only known me as Morgan, but I do this other stuff over here as Gail and Gail and Larry. And then as more books came out, we started to have all of the urban fantasy series, both as Gail, Gail and Larry and, and Morgan, all intersect. Yes, I know. And, and so now we kind of have- this, <laughs> Yes, I know. <laughs> some of the friends, some of the readers call it the Martin Cinematic Universe. Uh, like Marvel, I like that. because they all they all crossed over, and that has been fantastic for getting people into both sides of the writing. Because while you don't have to read all of them to follow the storyline, there will be things you will learn if you read all of them that you won't otherwise know. And this last Deadly Curiosities book, Deadly Curiosities was the um, urban fantasy series that started off with Solaris. And in the last one, Inheritance, it crosses over with the guys from Witchbane, which is a Morgan Bryce book, and some of the other characters from the Night Vigil series, which is not romance, and from the um, Treasure Trail and Badlands series, which are Morgan, all show up in it. But the physical characters from Witchbane show up in Charleston with the Deadly Curiosities folks, and they team up to fight the bad guys. And so that is always, a crossover as you can get. And we've always had that my Bubba and Harker universe is kind of bump up against the Martin Cinematic Universe. I'm just... We're stealing that. That's official now. It, it works. <laughs> yeah, because I've had Quincy Harker go into Trifles and Folly mm -hmm. in one of the books that I wrote and interact with one of your characters. And then some of your Morgan characters show up in your last Mark Wojcik book that is part of the Bubba the Monster Hunter universe. So it it all kind of bumps up against each other. Well, and Mark Wojcik has made, you know, comments about, you know, it's out of my territory, but I'm going to send it to a friend of mine down in Georgia. <laughs> hey, Garth. And, yeah. And then, um, yeah, definitely Mark shows up in, in quite a few of the Morgan books. And he'll show up even more in the next Witchbane book because it'll be back kind of in his stomping ground. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and it's a wonderful way to have an excuse in the back of the book to say, well, if you haven't read this other stuff, you'll definitely get some insights. And I think that has helped all of the series grow. Because I know people who have set out to read everything. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know that when you started this endeavor, you and everybody you were talking to fully expected there to be a lot of Morgan to Gale crossover because romance readers read everything. They read voraciously, and they will read everything by a, that an author's ever sneezed on. But, yeah, I'm with you. I'm a, I was surprised that there was as much cross-pollination in the other direction, because epic fantasy readers tend to be a little more siloed. Do you think, and it depends on the reader. Go ahead. Sorry. Do you think that any of that is altered by the fact that you had traditionally published urban fantasy and epics, so those fans were already kind of trained to expect multiple things from you? I'm sure that didn't hurt. I mean, there was some question about, you know, honestly, the reason that I think Solaris brought me in on the Deadly Curiosity series was because at the time, I was under contract to Orbit for Epic Fantasy, and they couldn't get me on Epic Fantasy because my contract precluded it. Okay. So, hey, let's bring her in on Urban Fantasy. Contract doesn't say anything about that, and yeah, we'll throw in the steampunk. Um, so I think that's really what opened the door there, as well as the story that I had written for them in an anthology. So, because I think a lot of traditional publishers, like I said, are very skittish about oh, well, you, you write this, you can only write this. And, and I... It's, it's huh? because of the way that books get purchased in their model. Because they live and die by bookstores. And Barnes & Noble has a very limited number of buyers for the United States. And they live and die by the Nielsen book scan numbers. They don't actually 
pay that close attention to, okay, well, Gail's Deadly Curiosity series sold amazing in Charleston, Savannah, and the Carolinas, but it didn't do so great in Butte. So maybe we'll order all of our copies in the Southeast and sprinkle a few out here in the areas that don't touch the content. They just say, well, this book sold this many thousand copies. Okay, we're gonna order for the next run this many thousand minus 20%. Well, and, and I heard Laurel K. Hamilton talk on a podcast about how her Anita Blake books initially got rejected pretty much by everybody because they couldn't figure out which shelf on Barnes and Noble to put them on. It is now solved by just giving her her own section. Yeah. Uh, and the same is true with Charlene Harris. Do you look for Charlene Harris under mystery? Do you look for her under urban fantasy? Do you look for her under horror? Well, when you're Charlene Harris, you're filed under all three. Right. Because they're just going to order that many copies. Right. And if you're her new series, where do you shelve weird westerns? Probably not next to Louis L'Amour. Probably not. But that series is really good. Yeah. I'm a yeah. sucker for westerns anyway, but. So, you know, I think that readers are a lot more flexible than New York and London ever gave them credit for being. And, you know, it's, it's true. I've got readers who only read my epic or only read my urban or only read the Morgan. Sure. But I've got a lot more. And, and even within series, hey, really love this series. Couldn't really get into this other series. I'm the same way you know, when I'm the reader. Mm -hmm. Not everything hits me, still love the author. Well, you but, know, speaking of Charlene Harris, I love her new series, her weird Western stuff. Having watched every season of True Blood, I can't really get into the Sookie Stackhouse books. The books were better. I believe you. I read the first one. Um, doesn't resonate with me. It's such, very, it's such very good, deep POV, mm -hmm. and that character's so specific, and I'm like, I know this girl, but I cannot look through her eyes for 300 pages at a time. <clears throat> yeah, and that happens. Yeah. Um, but in general, people have followed much more than I dared hope, and that's been wonderful, and it's, it's cross-pollinated both directions. Now, something else you've got going on that is hopefully helping a lot of people cross-pollinate is continual. And that's what I meant when I said you're, I'm, that I'm not the only person who you approach and say, so I did a thing. <laughs> Tell us about the what is continual and where did it come from? Because it's all your fault. <laughs> Famous last words, yeah. Um, so Continual is the con that never ends. It is the online, ongoing convention, multi-genre convention. And you can find it on Facebook. We're building out the, um, the webpage presence. It's, it's really growing and expanding. But the idea came uh, in mid-March when things started to shut down. And it had actually grown from something before that where John and, and a bunch of other uh, of us in our kind of core group have had been talking about how epic fantasy didn't have as much of an online meeting place or gathering spot. Urban fantasy had a few, but it, it wasn't really, you know, hadn't really coalesced. Romance had a ton of them and look how well it's working for them. Why can't we build something like that over here for some of these other things? We kind of pull everybody together. And we talked about that, hadn't quite figured out how to do that and enter pandemic and stuff starts shutting down. And so before breakfast one day while I was on vacation, I said, well, let's, let's put together this online convention. And I put the Facebook group together. And then I sent a message to John and Jim Nettles and a bunch of other people and said, hey guys, I did this thing. Uh, what do you think? I think this might be our opportunity to build out that online gathering spot that brings everybody together. And because they bought in, it is uh, really growing into something that is turning out to be very exciting. And it's, it, 
it is so much a group effort. Couldn't do it without everybody that's on uh, the team because everybody brings their, their skills, their contacts, their know-how. I mean, it, it's a wonderful thing. And it's a lot of fun to be doing this with a bunch of my friends. And but, it's also now becoming a hosting platform for some of the conventions that are shutting down. It is. And I think our goal here is to create a, a meeting place for multiple genres where, unlike the, the local conventions where people are really limited by distance and geography and expense, and they, so they only go to the conventions that maybe are within a two-hour drive. This allows you to have that convention experience with fans and, and authors and other guests that um, are from everywhere. So there, all of those uh, reasons not to go to a con are gone, as well as, you know, total safety in the pandemic. You're, you're sitting at home consuming this, but we're, we're really building out into panels and author interviews and, li and readings and live gaming and uh, musical performances. And it's just so exciting to see it build out. And again, that comes from sitting down taking stock not only of what our, our core operating group knew how to do and had competencies in, but also saying, okay, uh, who do we know? Who can we invite to come play with us? And fortunately, given the gang of folks we had, that was mostly everybody. So <laughs> we, we've started to put the touch out to our friends and say, hey, we're doing this thing. Want to come play with us? And uh, look, you get to talk to a whole bunch of new people. And yeah. so that's where it is. It's growing. And I'm really thrilled to see all of the exciting things that are starting to happen out there. Yeah, I mean, I hosted one of the movie nights on Sunday, and we watched the Tiger King reunion show. I hosted a movie watch night for Tremors, and we all watched. Which is, you know, almost like Tiger King. It almost is. Kevin Bacon. That's sad. <laughs> well, Gail, thank you very much for hanging out with us. Um, I would ask you what you've got coming out, but since we're not sure when this will air, we'll just say, look in the show notes and you can find all of the places. Where can people follow you on social media if they're too lazy to look down on the show notes or if they're watching on some device that makes that difficult? Well, the website is uh, galzmartin.com. Twitter is at Gail Z. Martin. Pinterest is G. Z. Martin. Instagram is Morgan Bryce author. The Morgan Bryce website is morganbryce.com. Try to make it really easy. And of course, you can find Larry there at the galzmartin.com is also the ascendantkingdoms.com, which is also the larrynmartin.com. Just all points to the same place. And then you can find information on your, on three of your series at falstaffbooks.com because we publish the Joe Max series, the Spell Salt and Steel series, and the Wasteland Marshall series. Currently. Yep. We'll see what, Hopefully we'll some see more pretty soon. It's yeah. under discussion. All right. Well, thank you, Gail. We appreciate you hanging out with us. And for those of you at home, well, I don't know. There's a little card coming up in a few seconds that'll have videos in it, you should click and watch one of those too, because they're also cool. And don't forget, for God's sake, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and ring the goddamn bell. Look at her. Look how excited Melissa gets just at the thought of you ringing the bell. It is not the devil's doorbell. That's different. But it makes Melissa almost as happy. So I'm going to leave you with that. Until next time, bye.